Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian, and we are continuing a series that we love to take a big ol' pause in between episodes of, but I'm really glad we did for this one because we are covering the CEDH tier list for all four and five color decks. That is right, every single four and five color CEDH viable deck that we've seen in the tournament space in the CEDH realm. We're gonna be covering them today, ranking them from S rank all the way to heavy, heavy fringe. And we're gonna be talking about why these decks go in those places. You know, this isn't uh, like a lot of tier lists. I actually try and, you know, take time to explain my uh, opinions on these people, where their placement in the metagame is, and go over the deck with as much detail as thoroughly possible. Now, you may notice as we go through this, there will be a tier list for partners at a different date, but if we went over every partner combination in any of the videos we've had so far, my God, they would never end. So we're gonna do partners at a later date. We'll probably do background commanders at that point as well too. And we'll be able to go over stuff like that. We might even have background commanders be their own video just because they're so unique and weird and, and you know, partner with is like a whole thing too. But I think we've covered most of the ones in, in that department that we wanted to cover anyways. All of that being said, let's talk about some four and five color commanders. Remember, if you like videos like this, make sure you smash, obliterate that like button, hit subscribe so you can get more stuff like this. And those things are literally free. You hit that little bell icon, you can know whenever we post a video also free. That one's just for you. But if you want to help this channel out, go over to patreon.com slash comedianmtg where every little bit of help goes such a long way. And I can't thank my current patrons enough. Y'all are the reason I can do this as, a, as part of my job. And uh, yeah, also we'll talk about coaching later in this episode. Uh, without any further ado, let's jump right in. Starting off with the four color option here, we have the Brea Ethereum Shaper. Now, until literally a couple weeks ago, I would have said that this card is not really worth playing as a CDH commander, right? Because it's in the color of Timnacrom, right? Which are two of the premier commanders in the format, two partners that are completely dominating that color space. And Brea is just that no card advantage in the command zone, really just an infinite mana outlet. And recently there was actually some movement where people were starting to play Liberator, Urza's Battlethopter, and Shimmer Mirror in Brea lists so that you can create infinite mana with your commander, or with infinite mana with things like uh, Oriok Salvagers or with Isochron Scepter and stuff like that, and then be able to flash in Brea from the command zone and win on top of other people's wins. And that reason alone makes me way more interested in Brea than I ever have been. It's like a very heavy Necropotence deck obviously a great way to win is either you know doing either of the lines we just talked about Final Fortune, Born Upon the Wind, all great ways to be able to win off of Brea. And then apart from that, it's just a, you know, four color sands green turbo pile, right? Not all quite turbo Nas, not quite, you know, turbo breach, but like all of the best basically win cons in our format jammed in these colors and trying to do all the best stuff. So there's only so bad this archetype can be. And I think Brea actually now with this new tech makes it all the way up to A tier, which I probably would have put it in like B if we were looking at this even a month ago. We got Tiamat. Now this is one of my favorite five color food gym commanders. Traditionally, people play the first sliver, which we will talk about later in this episode. I just think Tiamat's really cool. It's the ability to have this five color food chain outlet, but you're not really restricted in the fact that like, you never want to hard cast the first sliver. Hard casting the first sliver like sucks, but you get to keep and have a higher card quality in your list. Whereas Tiamat kind of lets you go and grab some, some really interesting dragons, right? And you basically have a combo in the command zone. Now it's very expensive. I think it costs something like 15, 16 mana to assemble the whole thing when you get Tiamat going. Uh, right, which is not the best thing, right? It, it, it definitely has a cost to it for sure. But if you do that, uh, you're you're sitting pretty. Your your combo is once again able to be grabbed just by playing mana from the command zone. And apart from that, you can do your Adna stuff. You can do food chain stuff. A lot of people have also tried dream halls because there's uh, combinations when you resolve a dream halls where you can basically go like, okay, pitch a thing, play team map for you from the command zone, get enough dragons to be able to assemble your combo by pitching them. And it's just like that's that's also a really unique way to win the game. Game and definitely, um, you know, not a very typical win condition. So, Tmat, I like it a lot. It's a really sweet five color food chain option. And despite it maybe not being as clean and efficient as the first sliver, it's got some cool stuff. So, let's throw it over in B tier. <sighs> Najila, 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 Najila. 
you know, it constantly fluctuates between the metagame hating this commander out because of how much it warps the metagame and then dominating the metagame. Just between those two, it's either A, in complete control of the metagame, or B, being so aggressively hated out because everyone remembers how badly it warped the metagame beforehand. So with that in mind, it's really hard to give Najila anything that isn't an S tier. It genuinely is such a strong commander. I mean, it has multiple one card win conditions. It comes down online super easily. It's easy as turn one, right? Jeweled Lotus, boom, Najila's on the battlefield. Mana Crypt, land, Najila's on the battlefield. Uh, Tinder Wall, right of flame. Najila is on the battlefield, right? Like I can think of a hundred examples how to get Najila on the battlefield turn one. On top of that, you get five colors, all the best colors in the game, uh, full Turbo Nas suite, full Underworld Breach suite, and once again, one card win conditions that are creature combos with your commander. Like what, there's very few things this commander doesn't get access to, and that's basically card advantage, which you can supplement by cards in the 99 of this deck. So, uh, you know, it's really easy to say for me that Najila is like definitive S tier commander. <sighs> My son, my Maelstrom boy, Yidris, the Maelstrom wielder. I love this commander. It is not great. <laughs> it's not great anymore, which is so sad because I love this card so genuinely. It's so cool. It's sans white. You get all of these crazy Turbo Storm cards. You get to be able to play Song of Creation, which is one of my favorite cards in Magic period. And, you know, you hit your opponents, you play a Song of Creation, you win the game that turn, right? Like there's almost zero ways to fizzle. But it is like the actual manual Storm deck that CEDH has wanted for quite some time, right? It is such a powerful, explosive manual Storm deck. The only problem is you have to play this commander that is blue, black, red, green, which is not an easy ask to be able to cast it for all of those colors and then transition into a storm game plan, right? There's a lot that can go wrong with that step, especially if your commander gets hit by a Gilded Drake or something like that, which kind of sucks because it's such a cool commander and, and I want it to be able to get down faster. It has everything that a turbo deck should have, except for a commander that's easily castable. So sad to say, I love Yidris. I think the card is amazing and I, I'm gonna play it one day, but I think it unfortunately has to live here in the seats here, which genuinely breaks my heart. <laughs> we have Scion of the Ur Dragon. Now this commander, may I say, I'm gonna shrink down the screen a little bit here. We Go. Scion of the Ur Dragon is a very new to CEDH commander in the sense of its modern representation, but old to commander in the fact that like it was the five color commander of choice for a very long time. Like you would bin World Gorger and like do infinite mana stuff with that. It was the the home, the shell of early five color hermit druid strategies. You know, we're talking about early 2016, maybe even before that CEDH, right? So it was a very, very different environment than the CEDH we know and love today. But five color hermit druid was a thing for a really long time. And nowadays it looks a lot different right now. Scion is sort of in the command zone as a value engine, either turning into a Dromoka to grand abolish your opponents or turning into an ancient silver dragon, drawing a bunch of cars, ancient copper dragon, Dragon, making up to 20 mana on your turn. There's so many ways that that card can really get out of hand and it's definitely pretty sweet. It's definitely a spicier brew and not one that's probably at the higher end of the power level, but I think with a little bit of work, fingers crossed a little bit of work this deck could uh maybe have more than just a single top 16 in its history for now though i'm gonna leave it in c tier and honestly that might be a little generous but like there's only so bad a five color deck can be you know Jensen, Carr, Thalian. So this deck is often this commander is usually paired with Luris because that way you get a five color Luris partnering or companioning. I've also seen it at the helm of like a five color commander that like wants to be super explosive kind of early on. So basically if you look at it kind of squinting, it's like a five color rock rack in a lot of ways, which is kind of interesting in that respect, right? It's not the best. It's definitely not as quick as rock rack, but for too many, you have something that turns on your mox ambers, your spring leaf drums, your fierce guardianships, your deflecting swats, your deadly rollicks. So it definitely provides a lot of value in the command zone and definitely is a card that has a decent amount of upside. So I think this is one of the least explored five color commanders and definitely has a little bit of room to grow and, and and explore some new archetypes. I definitely have seen it mostly be relegated to Hermit Druid strategies, but I think it has a lot of potential and I'm interested to see what, what happens with it in the future. Let's see, uh, let's say it's, I don't know. This is a tough one. I think it's somewhere around here. You know, I think there's a certain level of like, at least Yudris has a game plan, Scion has a game plan. So let's, let's put it in the middle of C right now. 
or I guess bottom, but it sh it'll end up being in the middle of C, I think. All right, we have Joda the Unifier, five color legendary Cascade Commander. This is a deck that people were really excited about at the printing of Dominary United, and then sort of just disappeared off the face of the earth. This commander was one that people were talking about a lot, and it looked like it had a lot of potential. And I saw one top 16 by Tom MTG who loves trying out the new spicy decks and is really the only person I saw play this deck except for like one other person who did not do well at a tournament way back in October of last year. So it's definitely been a deck that people were talking about, very, very excited about, and then just really ghosted. Um, so I don't know if it's a matter of like, you've already invested five mana in your commander, or how much more can you invest to then start cascading into other legends? Maybe that's the case. I just feel like it's like, sort of this five color crater hoof in the command zone. And there's only so bad like a five color stacks that can be. But as we know about CEDH in general, it, it, stacks is just such an underexplored archetype week in, week out. And it's just one of those things that people really, really fail to put in the work for because it's a hard archetype. It is very difficult to play stacks correctly. And I think this is just another case of a really solid stacks commander just kind of getting overlooked by how hard stacks is in general. So for that reason, I think it has a lot of potential still. It's still a card to look at every time I see it and go, ah, one of these days, I'm going to break this thing. So for me, it definitely ends up at the higher end of B tier. Gigantha. Now everyone knows Gigantha as a companion, but Gigantha is not actually that bad by herself. I actually really like Gigantha at the helm of a five color, like storm turbo Nas type of deck, basically. Uh, there's a lot of enchantments that are specifically all color pips. So for example, cards like Jeskai Ascendancy, which is pure Jeskai color pips, can easily be cast with Gigantha's ability. You know, you can use its ability to resolve a pretty sweet post ad nauseum Gigantha, right? you can use the one black from its ability to pay for the Nas and you have four mana left over for that. And then usually, you know, with the Sans black that you have left over floating, you can still do some pretty crazy stuff. So I think Gigantha actually is pretty underplayed. But yeah, with um, Song of Creation, like we were just talking about, Whirlwind of Thought, Jeskai Ascendancy, all these cards are like really cool combos with Gigantha. And I really think that the card has a lot of potential in that way. So it's pretty sweet. And uh, I think it definitely is worth checking out. As far as where I'd rate it, I think, you know, to really craft a good Gigantha deck, I think you'd have to be probably on the lower end of B tier, but definitely has a little bit less of a cohesive plan than something like a Tiamat. And I don't know if it's as good as a Yidris. I think if we have to C tier Yidris, I think Gigantha probably goes around here. Asika, Essica, Prismatic Bridge. This card is sick. It's got two sides to it, and I've seen like completely different decks built around this card. I mean, uh, Spleenface was kind of like infamous or famous for playing this five color stacks deck. And the idea was that like you would play every stacks piece, like every single one. You'd play your Stony Silence, you'd play Rule of Law, you'd play Trinisphere, you played all of these things. Maybe not Trinisphere, because I think that actually messes with the card. But you play all of these aggressive, intense stacks pieces, and then you would just resolve the prismatic bridge and just flip into just stupid stuff like I'm talking about you know tired about tyrants and Ugin the spirit dragon and just silly silly stuff so it was just this like five color hard stacks deck with like just this clock in the command zone that would flip into most ridiculous things I think it's kind of underexplored if I'm being honest and I think it's a deck that I think people could spend a little bit more time on I think it's despite being rather ridiculous as a strategy it like works <laughs> and I think that's the funniest part about the whole thing and then Eska on the front half has also lent itself to a number of other combo decks in the format. So Eska being able to tap for mana, Jeskai Ascendancy from in the hands of uh, Drake Sasser was a deck that he was playing with Eska for quite some time. There is also just a number of other archetypes and things like that that have been tried out with Eska. I know I've seen like five color mid range decks very similar to like what people do with, uh, you know, Kenrith nowadays. So I think Eska just has a lot of potential. The Prismatic Bridge side has a lot of potential. And I think for that, it just gets like a high B tier. I don't think it's like A by any means but I think it's definitely really solid. Oh, uh, history has not been kind to you, my sliver friend. Food Chain First Sliver has been the premier five color food chain archetype for quite some time, but for some reason, it has just not been doing huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it's such an interesting deck because it has no card advantage in the command zone, but it is so clean and efficient at doing what Food Chain does, right? Being able to cast the deck, go through, win with a Thoracle, all of that kind of stuff. And there's been some innovation as of the past few years. Some people are actually playing Humility with Food Chain in the first sliver because Food Chain can actually win with the first sliver's ability because it's a cast trigger. Um, so you can actually win with Food Chain with a Humility on the battlefield. So that's a really interesting 
interesting archetype. Uh, it also leads to like some five color Turbo Nas style stuff. It's definitely a weird deck for sure. But a five color food chain with humility is a thing that people can play. And also a five color food chain in general, just a very strong archetype, something that is going to get a lot of dividends over the years. And uh, it's a powerful, powerful thing to be playing. Unfortunately, it's just been being beaten up by a lot of the stuff in the format. Rule of Law Winter was like a really bad time for food chain. You know, when when Rule of Laws were dominating the format, it didn't matter if it was a Turbo Nas deck or a food chain deck, they both got hit by Rule of Laws. Now we're under, a, you know, a Ristic study meta, right? So every time you're casting your food chain combo, you're just drawing people cards and there's no way you actually get to combo off through all of that. So all of that being said, uh, food chain is in a bit of a tough spot and it's it's sad to say, but hopefully as you go into the future, we get to see some really cool food chain stuff. And uh, maybe, as I said, this this new version of food chain playing five color humility, maybe maybe it's a thing, maybe it's a thing. So uh, it, it's hard to say historically. I think we're, we're looking here, right? It's definitely performed more more cohesively in the the known history than a lot of the decks I'm seeing here in this B tier. But I think it, it rests at the top of B tier. I, I don't feel comfortable making it a sissé. God, I love this deck. Sissé is so freaking good. It's so good. I think this card's insane. I think it's so powerful, so strong. I love this commander. I think it's super, super strong. And its ability to win through rule of laws, through Ristic studies without casting spells in certain circumstances is huge. It is one of the most difficult decks in the format just because you have to basically problem solve just to win with your deck, right? Unless you have a Dockside line, which definitely makes things a lot easier. But even then, there's still a lot of math you have to do. There's still a lot of figuring out, like if I chain this into this, into this, that'll give me enough colors, then I have to activate again. You know, how do I do this? at end step? Do I do it in a way where I can be protected the whole time? Can I shut off my opponent's spells while also trying to combo? There's so many questions that you can ask with this deck, and it does give you a lot of the answers. It is a powerful, powerful commander that allows a lot of flexibility, and the Planeswalker lines, I think, are pretty clearly the optimal way to be playing this deck. Through the hands of myself, Baneslayer, Malcolm, it's been doing really, really well lately, and if it's not S tier, it's definitely top of A. Like, it is one of the premier decks in the format right now, and I really have zero hesitation saying that the deck is very very strong very flexible and i adore it truly and it's also so weird it's such a weird s tier deck or a tier deck but like it's so it plays weird cards plays unique strategies and archetypes it's just awesome i love it i love it we have Atraxa the Grand Unifier, seven mana Atraxa, bad tivet as some call it. Uh, Atraxa is freaking great, man. Like I think this deck is absolutely sweet. It is crazy because I thought it was kind of a meme when it came out. I really, I was one of the people who was like, there's no way that this bad food chain deck is any better than the first liver, but this has been one of the best performing decks of this past month, specifically over the time of releasing this video. It had like a 40% conversion rate as of this last month. And it's just been one of those decks that's like completely invalidated the things that came before it. Like Timnath Rassios is just like not a thing. And Atraxa is replacing the Sans Red deck of the format and pretty, pretty cohesively. I think when we all looked at it as a food chain only commander, we were like, oh, it's just so much worse than things that existed before. But instead, what it is, is a four color value pile that has food chain as one of its many ways to win. And that's kind of where the sweet spot is. And there's a lot of people like uh, Christopher K. Claw and a bunch of others who like really did a lot of innovation early on to make this the deck that it is right now. So yeah, this deck is sweet, definitely. Definitely also one of the best decks in the format as of time of recording. So I don't think it's as good as Sisse, but it's a conversation, definitely. And I think uh, I'll put it right here. But like these two easily can have a conversation about who gets what slot. They're both extremely strong decks and definitely make the top of A tier for sure. King Kenrith himself. Let's talk about this guy. One of the most flexible commanders to ever be printed. I mean, I've seen this at the helm of a reanimator deck. I've seen it at the helm of an infinite mana combo deck. It's a mid-range deck. It's a turbo Nas deck. What can Kenrith not do? The answer is come down early and turn on your fierce guardianships and your deflecting swats, which is the biggest restriction of this card. It is five mana. It's a big cost to get this bad boy out. And it doesn't grind in the same way Thrasios does. You really underestimate if you don't play with Thrasios how much of the difference between just drawing a card with Kenrith and scrying and drawing 
one with Thrasios is also the fact that once again, Thrasios, boom, two mana on the battlefield, you are grinding away right away. Kenrith, he has to make a giant five mana investment just to play the commander and then do the thing, right? So like a lot of these strategies that are doing really well with Kenrith are a lot more of these like using Kenrith as an infinite mana outlet commanders, as opposed to relying on Kenrith for your game plan. A lot of the best Kenrith decks aren't even playing Jeweled Lotus because they don't really care about casting Kenrith that much. It's more like when it needs to be a great outlet, it is. And it's one of the best infinite mana outlets out there because not only does it you know convert infinite mana into a win, but it also just kills your opponents, right? Like you don't have to dig through your deck for a certain thing, right? Because a lot of the time you just force your opponents to draw until they're dead, right? And that is a super strong way to do things. And Kenrith is awesome uh it's hard to say where it lies i think as of right now once again as of the time of this recording which is the september end of september 2023 i have to say kenrith feels to me like it is worse than atraxa and worse than sisse but not by a lot i mean the, this conversation right here the brea kenrith thing is something i used to say well brea is always just better right or sorry well kenrith is always just better than brea which is true in a lot of circumstances with the flash stuff brea starts to have a leg competitively but kenrith still strong doing what it needs to be doing and uh yeah just just still killing the game uh down here i have cecily uh this was a mistake i did not mean to put it in this episode so that will be in the partner episode we will talk about the friends forever combinations and uh yeah we're gonna have a lot of stuff to talk about on the partner and friends forever and background commander episode for sure <laughs> Cody, the book that's chapters once threatened to ruin the sanctity of CEDH. This little silly book, at one point, people thought it was the end of the world. It really looked like it was going to be warping CEDH in an incredibly toxic way. But then people learned to play around the book. And, you know, it stole the tournament that it was first played at, you know, the Into the North guys came and they absolutely crushed people with this thing. It did amazing. And then people figured out how Cody works. It's only kind of gotten worse over time. And it's definitely a commander that so many people hate playing that I wouldn't be surprised to know or to hear that it's actually better now than it has been historically. But as of right now, uh, Cody is kind of nowhere to be seen in CEDH, despite being an extremely viable five color Terminoz commander. I just think it folds to a lot of stuff. And because of that, people are just not on it. People are not respecting the book and it's just not being sleeved up. I literally can't even think of the last time a Cody was sleeved up. And actually what we're going to do is we're going to take a little pause here. Going to go over here to EDH top 16. And I'm going to type in Cody vociferous codex boom we have three performances since september of last year so, so since september 2022 there have only been three people who have played it uh one person went two two in the fishbowl and then one person played at cash cards one person played it at mox masters august so you could say confidently this deck is just not being played seeing he's been played three times in a year i don't think it's as bad as you know, being played three times as a year. So I do think it's underexplored and under messed around with basically. But uh, yeah, I do think Cody's easy to disrupt on a certain level too, right? So for that, let's put Cody down here in C tier, maybe even a low B. Um, you know, if I'm going to do my boy Idris like that, then I think Cody's just got to be, oh, it breaks my heart. Cody's a little bit better probably, huh? It's probably a little bit better than team at too. Maybe... Maybe like the here space, you know, uh, it definitely compared to these other commanders here. It has a tournament win under its belt than compared to Eska and Joda and things like that. Damn, that's heartbreaking. OK. All right. Niv Mizzet Reborn. This was the premier five color food chain deck for like a month <laughs> until the first sliver was printed. I still think to this day there is room for this commander to get enough two color options that it actually ends up having a higher card quality than the first sliver but that's not where it is right now and it's a commander I literally pick up try and brew again and then realize why I don't play it again maybe once every couple months so I'm gonna put it in archetypes people play that I'm suspicious of people being me and suspicious of still being me so <laughs> that is where it's at i love this five color niv but it's uh it struggles for sure the jelly bean angry jelly bean himself omnath locus of creation now despite it being a terrorist in pioneer and modern it has just been okay in cedh the biggest problem is the other sans black decks in the format kind of do what this deck wants to do just a little bit better and the fact that this commander does not have card advantage in the command zone and it's also not an infinite mana outlet 
palette kind of makes it a little bit worse than the other options that exist currently in these colors. So you have decks like Akiri Thrasios and Bruce Thrasios just putting up better results than Omnath has in the past. Now it's still an infinite mana outlet with a meal. It's still an infinite food chain outlet. It still works with a lot of different things. As of right now though, the bean has not been there and has not been putting up results. So it's strong. Yeah, I mean, the ability for it to like crack a fetch land and make four mana is definitely really strong and really powerful. It's just it's just not getting there in the same way, which is rather unfortunate. And before we go on any further, let's talk about CEDH coaching. Now, you can receive CEDH coaching through me on this channel here. If you want to receive coaching from the person who has more wins with different CEDH decks than any other person for the past two years, feel free to hit me up at email at comedianmtg at gmail.com. Hit me up on Discord, or you can find me on Twitter as well. Coaching has two forms now, one which is one-on-one -on -one coaching where we sit down over call on Discord and talk about the areas you want to improve on, whether it's you know helping make a deck more viable, whether it's talking about politics and how you do better on that, mulligan skills, all of that type of stuff, or there's gameplay coaching, which you can sit down with me and three other people, and we will uh, sit down and, and just play some CEDH, and in between games, we'll pause, talk about options, things like that. If you have interest in any of those, please hit me up on either, my, once again, my email, comedianmtgdmail.com, my Discord, or my Twitter. Thanks. Further ado, let's get back into it with our last commander here, Tazri, the Beacon of Unity, our last commander here. This one's just interesting because it is the only five color commander with an infinite colorless outlet that actually has the potential to win the game that turn. Now, there's technically that Sliver, the Sliver Broodlord or something like, or Hive Mother, that uh, also can convert infinite colors outfit to infinite bodies, but this one can actually draw through a deck and get to a point where you can draw your whole deck and present a win. Problem is, it's one of those things, uh, kind of like Kenrith, but a little bit, you know, once again, colorless, you, you don't get to play all of the best creature options because, you know, you only can get party cards off the top of your deck, right? Which is where you get Diviner's Wand that turns into infinite draws. Uh, but you have to play some less than perfect cards in your 99. And then it's an infinite colored mana outfit. It's an infinite colorless mana outlet. But it is still one of those commanders that hasn't really seen a lot of play because the commander itself doesn't really do a lot, right? As compared to a deck like Thrasios decks, the activated ability is actually way more relevant for a thing like Thrasios. So Tazri, it's, I think it's actually still pretty viable. I think it's a very, very underexplored commander as I think a lot of people just kind of wrote it off as like a, a more gimmicky commander, but I think it probably goes here around the seed tier, probably a little bit better than Gigantha. And I think surprisingly, maybe around here, just under Yidris in the C tier, uh, still think it's very good, just has kind of been unproven and no one's really put a lot of work into it. But that's our four and five color tier list. It definitely is not as long as some of the other episodes because when you go into three and two color combinations, my God, are there a lot of combinations. Uh, hopefully we will have time to do uh, background commanders soon and friends forever and partners. And that's basically it for remaining stuff. And this is definitely a thing I want to try and update as time goes on. I know people really enjoy these tier lists and I know people really enjoy the conversations around them. And I am so curious Yes. What do y'all think about some of these results here? I know people are going to agree with certain things that I've done here and definitely vehemently disagree with others. And that's totally awesome. And I'm excited to hear what y'all think. Please tell me in the comments below. This is some cool stuff and I love making these videos. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Peace.